Hey guys, thanks for watching Make Me Smart. I know it's weird because it's a podcast, but I appreciate it. And we know that you tune in each week because data collection. So just make it easy on yourself. Hit the subscribe button. It's so easy. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. Hey, I say it's it the music. and it comes in my headphones. How about that? Magical. Hey, everybody, I'm Kai Rizdal. And he has magic powers. I'm Molly Wood. <laughs> oh, wait. I'm sorry. Who are, you? Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> he had the, ma he had the magic now. power of, of getting me to show up this yes. week. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. I'm telling you, this is all going to culminate in such great stories, all these reporting yeah. trips. Uh, but none of, the, none of that is what we're here to talk about because this, of course, <laughs> is Make Me Smart, <laughs> the podcast about tech, economics, and culture where none of us is as smart as all of us. And I know that because you've all been carrying me for like weeks now. Yeah, but that's a whole different conversation, up. which we will have not in front of microphones. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so look, uh, we're going to pick up today with a thing we've been doing on and off for a number of months now, and that is um, a, a larger offshoot in and of itself about capitalism and whether it's working for enough people. Spoiler alert, it's not. Uh, and we've been talking about the economics of inequality on this podcast, and we continue that today. Uh, with gender. Yep. So, and we're going to have a somewhat of a specific conversation. I do want to make it clear before we even start that this is not, this is not like a problem just for women, right? right. We can talk about the gender gap. Yep. We can talk about the persistent wage gap, the, how women made a bunch of gains in corporate America and then, and then regressed. But economists believe that women's equality and equality of all kinds is the key to growth and prosperity, to effective climate action, to world peace, all kinds of social and economic good comes from reducing inequality on all fronts. And that is why we're doing this series. Um, and so we're very excited to, well, Kai is very well, excited, well, totally turns am. out, because he's well, a fan of our so, guest today. So look, what happens is before you turn the microphones on, you have a little chit chat with the guest, you say hi, whatever. And I confess to Emily Bazelon, who's coming on, that I'm a huge fan of hers. I like her writing. I like the Slate Political Gab Fest. And now you all know. Thanks for embarrassing and me. And now you know. I appreciate that. <laughs> and you're setting and so, me up here. Like, well, now what no if I bomb, that's, guys? that's right. No pressure. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Don't panic. But you have to be awesome because we already know you are. Um, so, Emily, we want to talk to you sort of about women in the workforce, right? There are lots of obviously facets to the women, uh, to the gender inequality story. What we want to talk really about is sort of like, why are female wages still stagnant? Why are women not staying in the workforce in America in comparison to other countries? What happened between sort of like the 70s and 90s when women really entered the workforce in droves and then it all sort of peaked in 2000? Um, Sound good? <laughs> good strategy? Yeah. Good slice? <laughs> Small topic. <laughs> yep. Let's go for it. <laughs> so, so I guess the bigger point is there was progress and, and now there kind of isn't, right? So what happened 40 years ago where women um, came into their own, I guess, in the workforce, right? Yeah. Well, 40 or 50 years ago, we still lived in a world where women could get fired for being pregnant or yeah. just for being a mother. So... If you think about that kind of reality, which also included a lot of sexual harassment that could run rampant um, before courts started stepping in in the 70s and 80s, those were the kinds of big problems that kept a lot of women from working or from advancing in very clear and obvious ways. And then I think also we should mention there were more cultural taboos against women working, more of an expectation that stay-at-home motherhood was superior to working motherhood, and more of a just kind of traditional division of labor between men and women. So, you know, what you see from the 70s and 90s are women surmounting a lot of those barriers, um, advancing and entering the workplace and kind of solving the big obvious problems. And now we have subtler barriers and I think um, hmm. problems that remain but are somewhat harder to put one's finger on. It's like we've kind of taken care of the easy stuff. Hmm. Right. So we got to work and then we discovered, boy, having it all is what? The worst is unfair is still, you know, what what happened around 2000? when things started to backslide a little bit? 
Well, I mean, first of all, I guess I always <laughs> I find the phrase having it all to be so tricky I know. because it's like, like a nightmare. what is that even? Yeah. Like, what does that even mean? Nobody really gets to have it all. It makes it seem um, out of reach to imagine that you can have full gender equality in the workplace. So I just I mm-hmm. feel like those are two separate things. But I think what you start seeing as women's advancement in the workplace stalls out are problems that have to do with kind of deeply seated attitudes as well as continuing structural inequality. So, for example, uh, we have lots of research showing what's called the double bind, which is that when women show that they're experts, that they're really smart at work, they can be perceived as less likable. And so a kind of um, overt expression of ambition and of skill, which is just like purely golden for men, Mm. tends to have more mixed results for women. And so that kind of subtler bias may be playing in right now to the kind of questions we have about why women aren't at the head of the table, right? Like we're talking about the being the president of the university or of the country. We're talking about top positions as well as this problem of some women deciding to drop out of the workplace. So it's the incremental gain uh, phase of this, I guess, now that we're in, that's the really the hardest part, right? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's also important to say tons of women are working, many more than did in the past. Um, and one of the reasons for that is just economics. There are is more pressure now on two parent families to have two incomes coming in. So I sometimes feel like we talk about this problem as if everybody experiences it as a reason not to work. There are many, many women who have to work. Now, they still may not be able to get as far as they would like to or would otherwise be able to in the workplace, but they can't afford to just stop working altogether. Well, and let's talk about sort of the ways that capitalism increased the pressure Also, like there's this piece from April uh, by Claire Kane Miller in The New York Times that basically says, you know, we now reward people for overwork. So even at a time when we we succeeded in bringing women into the workplace, we took away balance. Yeah, it's like the rules change. I mean, the statistic that just blows me away every time is that parents, including mothers, spend more time now with their children than stay at home mothers did Hmm in the 50s through the 70s. And yet, as Claire did a a fabulous job in that piece at showing, this is happening even as the demands of employers rise. And so if you're in a high-level job, you may well face pressure to be available to your clients or to your bosses at all hours. Like, right, this is the the disadvantage of the phone slash computers that we all carry around in our pockets. And then if you're, you know, a worker who works by the hour, you may face the kind of scheduling where you're supposed to be on call all the time. And that's another real barrier to any kind of balance and something that, you know, women, I think, look, everybody can find those aspects of the workplace to be really frustrating and dehumanizing. But if women continue to have more responsibility for kids and other aspects of family life, then those are problems that impact them more. The catch, of course, is that uh, when men, and this is to this day, right, it's not even a thing from the 60s or whatever, but when men are dealing with clients or late meetings or what have you, there is more often than not, even if the wife works uh, full time plus, she winds up carrying the load at home uh, in addition to the load at the office. Yes. I mean, Arlie Hochschild wrote about this several years ago as the problem of the second shift. And since Mm -hmm. then, we've seen men pick up some more of the load, but we still see imbalance. And I think a lot of women will talk about a kind of frustration with hidden work, like all the effort that goes into kind of scheduling. You know, kids, middle class kids have become like a huge individual project in a way (laughs) that just wasn't true when I was growing up. Like you're not allowed to just like have your kid let themselves into the house and like goof off and watch TV for the rest of the afternoon. There are all these ways in which um, kids don't have unscheduled time that was less demanding of parents. And so, again, we're seeing the demands of the family rise at the same time as employers' demand rises. And that's just like an an impossible equation for a lot of women and families. So what are some of the – I mean, one thing we talk about a lot in America is that our, you know, parental leave, our family support system – is just not there. Is 
is that enough? Is that a, how significant a step is that? Like if we're starting to sort of evaluate solutions, how important it is, is it to have childcare available and, and family leave for everybody? I'm really glad you brought this up because these are these kind of structural underpinnings that make us different from certain European countries where women have an easier time getting into the workplace and staying there. So imagine a world in which, you know, every American has access to good quality, affordable, flexible childcare from a very young age of their child on, and then also has parental leave that allows them to stay home for months, not weeks, with their kid when they're born or adopted, and that maybe is even more flexible. So if you have a sick relative or someone you want to take care of, you can step out. Those would change people's lives in material and important ways, and yet they remain out of reach for a lot of people living in this country. Can we um, talk socioeconomic um, sort of impacts here, right? Because uh, certainly the root of my question and some of the things that that we've been talking about, uh, we were talking women in mostly executive jobs and white collar, those kinds of things, right? And and they're getting squeezed on that end. What happens for blue collar women, lower income women, and how do they deal with this? Mm -hmm. Well, I think these problems of, you know, equality, affordable child care loom very large. You know, if you don't if you have fewer resources, then that can be an even bigger burden. It also can be uh, an issue that that puts pressure on. Let me rephrase that. The the desperate need for good child care can also lead people to decide to stay very near their families um, in order to have family members like grandparents help raise kids. That can be great, but it also can reduce people's economic mobility, their ability to move somewhere for a job. And so that can also be something that restricts people's lives and their um, their ability to move up the economic ladder. And then I also think this problem of companies that schedule workers where you don't find out until the last minute when you're going to be at work. And so you're supposed to somehow be able to just appear and scramble around for someone to take care of your kids. I literally just don't understand how that's yeah. feasible for people. It yeah. just seems so difficult to me. And that is a burden that really is um, borne by, you know, blue, but borne by people who have less desirable jobs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it sounds like you're saying, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you may be suggesting that the gig economy is also not going to, you know, for as, for all the promises that it's so much more flexible and it's great for moms. It sounds like you're saying, yeah, that's not that's not what we're asking for here. I mean, it depends. The gig economy can give you control over your own schedule. I'm talking more about companies, you know, like fast food companies where you just don't find out when you're supposed to show up at work until the day before. And so then you're supposed to adjust everything. The problem with the gig economy is, you know, what kind of health insurance do you have? What kind of job security? It can make people feel very fly by night in terms of their career development and the economic security in their lives. Mm-hmm. So so if the social science is clear, uh, and we all know this to be a problem, and you and many, many others write about it in high-profile publications that get a lot of circulation, um, what are the answers? <laughs> I love the idea <laughs> I, that writing articles actually, yeah, well, like, yeah, changes everything, because yeah. I always want, well, I always want to feel that way. It's like, well, I figured <laughs> yeah. this out. I, I interviewed the <laughs> smartest people about this yeah. problem, and here are these solutions. Like, let's get going. And yet one comes back years later, and somehow it's not yeah. actually fixed. Um, look, I think that we could have a government that is interested in doing more to support families. Um, it could be the kind of child-based tax credit that families can spend however they want, or it could be a major investment in early child care specifically as a way of promoting and um, helping more women succeed in the workplace. I think those things could make a big difference. Uh, You could also imagine changing the composition of corporate boards so that there are people who are thinking about gender equity issues on those boards and reining in companies from this idea that you have to have people constantly on call. That is a kind of, you know, guardrail for capitalism that uh, I feel like, again, in Europe, people um, are much more open to this idea. Um, and it's something that is actually polls really well in the United States, the idea of having more worker participation on corporate boards. So maybe we should be thinking about that. And then I think you have these trickier, more nebulous 
challenges of culture and people's attitudes. So, you know, how do you go about making it so that when women are highly qualified and they express themselves and their ambitions at work, they're not dinged for it somehow? I'm not sure. I mean, you can have some kinds of awareness about that. Um, One really interesting piece of research is that if you prime people at work to think a lot about gender difference, you actually sometimes worsen the problems women have advancing. And that actually it's more useful to give supervisors and employees a message about how we all share most core common attributes, and that will actually make them more likely to see women as worthy of promotion to kind of look past the gender differences that can subtly influence, um, you know, who gets the nod and who doesn't in ways that are not particularly fair or skills based. I guess I just have one question left, which is, is you said a minute ago, we all know this is a problem. And, you know, I was saying in the lead, like, I really want you guys to understand that this is not just a problem for us. This is not just saying, hey, I don't want to have to work two jobs just because I go to work and I also am doing the bulk of the parenting or whatever it is. Do we all know it's a problem? I mean, I think, have we internalized this idea that Hmm. we cannot all succeed unless we all succeed? I don't think we have properly internalized that. I think we're in a world in which people feel so much sense of competition and insecurity that it's actually really hard to take that attitude, right? Like that attitude begins from a place of generosity where you feel like you are secure in yourself and so you can afford to think about other people. Um, I feel like the anxiety about decline and some kind of sense that, you know, the economy is not on the right track or that your kid's not going to get into the right college. Like there are all these pressures on people that make it very hard to feel like, oh, okay, we're all swimming in the same sea. We need to support each other, et cetera. I wish I felt more um, rosy about that, but Hmm. I worry about whether we have enough of a sense of shared community. Emily Bazelon uh, writes on gender issues for the New York Times Magazine. Um, she, what else do you do? You do a thing at Yale Law School, right? And the Slate I Political do. Manifest. I teach a class. There, there. you go. All right. A well, thing. you were a fellow there. A for, thing. I don't know, you know. You That's know, awesome. Thing, whatever. Uh, Emily, yeah. thanks so much. I, I really appreciate Emily, the time thank your you. expertise. Thank you very much. Well, there you go. Emily Bazelon. Emily Bazelon's fantastic. I love, I think that last point about the generosity that yep. it takes yep. is so profound because everyone feels so scarce everybody even who has enough you know and then you and if you complain about it you get yelled at because of your privilege but it's Mm -hmm. like everyone feels like time and and emotion and love are just so scarce that you just can't give anything that's that is profound and heartbreaking make me smart at marketplace.org is where you send your thoughts your emails your voicemails uh about this or frankly anything you hear on this podcast yeah uh we're coming back bye There we go. We're back. We're back. We're back with a little accompaniment by me, I suppose. New sound effects Uh, and stuff. Wow. Yeah. There's a whole long story. Wow. But anyway. Uh, Okay. So, so for the first time in, I believe it's three weeks, we're actually going to talk about what's on our minds news wise. Um, What do you got? Has it really been three weeks? Well, with that in mind, I have two things. Oh, (laughs) gee. Get the. (laughs) I should have done three things so that I had one for every week that we missed. Fine. I was lost it's without you. Fine. <laughs> I was here, yo. I was lost I know. without you. Shut up. One of them one of them is literally just a mention. Uh yes. and that mention is, oh my goodness, it looks like there's a banana pants rule after all. Oh, I know. Well, you gotta explain it that. Give the backstory. Yeah, it's come crazy. from yeah. the SEC. Yeah. Uh yeah. So uh lo these many weeks ago <laughs> when last we did a news fix, <laughs> I talked about the We Work IPO. And suggested that maybe there should be some kind of rule, which is like, hey, if you reveal all your financials and they appear to be more obfuscated than anybody's SEC Uh filing has ever been and so on and so forth, that like maybe you shouldn't go public at all. And is there a rule about that? And there is not a rule from the SEC. However, it turns out that as more and more uh, of the internal workings of WeWork's finances became public, there started to be a free market rule. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right, right. Banks were like, huh. I don't think you might actually be worth $47 billion. Yeah. And so then there has been talk that they might have cut in half the valuation when uh, the company goes public. And now, uh, just as of Monday the 9th, it looks like SoftBank, mm-hmm. which is, the I think we can argue, 
the organization that has been propping up a lot of bad businesses yeah. in the Valley, um, the big venture capital fund, uh, is now maybe saying like, hey, banana pants, don't go public. <laughs> All right. And Until banana pants was, Molly said this, this S1 that we were to put out was banana pants because it was, it was bananas. It was crazy. So right. much so, so that it should trigger a rule yes. that From says SEC you that cannot subject public markets to your. It's crazy. It's just like craziness. Bad. So anyway, that's happening. Anyway. All right. So there's that. That's your, that's your mention. What's your actual one? Uh, I mean, my actual one is also weirdly just a mention, which is like, Hey, <laughs> I feel like we barely even noticed Given, given everything else that is going on, that possibly one of the largest antitrust actions anybody can remember has been undertaken by, what, most of the attorneys general in the United States? 48 against, states uh, and District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Yes. Yep. Yep. That. Thank you. Yes. Not California, weirdly, yes. but against, uh, against big tech. Things yeah. have gotten pretty well, so real. So in do this you, department. Let me ask you, though, do you think it's actually going to go anywhere? I mean, I think in some of these states it's going to go somewhere. Yeah. I, right. I, I don't know what I don't know what it looks like, but I do, but yeah, right. How could it not at this I, point? I don't know. That don't was know. a dumb question. You're right. That's pretty nice. <laughs> how could I don't know. Have, have you met 2019? I'm just saying. Right. Exactly. Yeah. To, in 2019, I would be deeply wary of predicting right. even right. tomorrow. <laughs> right. I right. also read this article about how apparently like the most dangerous volcanoes in the world, like we have no data on. Mm. Really? We're just not watching them. Yeah. Cause we can't get any tech near there. Wow. So like well, that's, Mount Hood could I, just blow. And you guys and don't give know. me a hard time about going dark. Here we're talking about obliteration of half the planet and Mollywood's like dum dee dum dee dum dee dum. Something I'm, happened. I'm Maybe waiting for the dark basic... thing. You guys, Jesus. <laughs> I get nothing. Crickets. Nobody Crickets. loves me. Yeah, fine. It doesn't count if I have to call for it. That's baloney. That's <laughs> BS. I'm not happy. That was, that was a miss. That's I don't know. Baloney. Somehow, maybe it's just my basic prepper tendencies, but for some reason, my Google News feed gives me a lot of like, an asteroid is coming and volcano. <laughs> How do you get out of bed in the morning? All right. I anyway. think something is going oh to come of this. God. All right. That well, is we'll my see. very short answer. We'll see. We'll see. I don't we'll know see. what it is yet. Uh, okay. So here's mine. Uh, and it goes back to the president of the United States adjusting the hurricane map to say that it was going to hit Alabama when... Oof. We all know that whole story. Here's, but but that that's the 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 lighter side, the leading edge of what is really a serious thing, right? Because people were in danger or thought they were in danger, but they weren't, and this whole deal. But yeah. reports the New York Times yesterday, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, under whom the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration lies, apparently got on the phone with the leaders of that organization and said, "If you don't uh, stop contradicting the president, I'm going to fire people." Now, uh, politicization of science is bad enough, okay? Let's just state that as a fact. Um, Mm -hmm. The catch is that underneath Secretary uh, Ross uh, in the Department of Commerce is also the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which provides critical data on the state of this economy to millions of businesses and people and our partners in global trade and you name it. And should we be at a point soon-ish where we start politicizing economic data, that would be really, really bad. And if I need to explain that to you, please listen to a little radio show I do called Marketplace. <laughs> okay? Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, we had polling. Yeah. We've been talking about this internally, yep. about how we had polling from, you know, back in 2016, yeah. saying that people didn't trust federal economic data because it didn't match up with their lived experiences. Right. They were saying, like, you're telling me the economy is great. My economy is not great. Not to steal the name of the series that you do on your show, Marketplace. <laughs> Yeah. And this kind of thing only exacerbates that. Yep. If you, this is yelling fire. Yes, I think it's really I mean, bad. in the purest sense of the word, yep. word, and if that extends to all the dealings yeah. with government, it, it's it's very it's bad. Really this bad. Is, yeah, this is really bad. Yes. Now the dark sting, you guys. Jesus. <sighs> Waiting. <laughs> Waiting. There Volcanoes! we go. Oh my God. There it is. <sighs> okay. All right. Okay. Now what? Save us Poor from Tony. ourselves. Poor Tony. He's filling Tony. in. The new, the Bless new, his heart. Yes. We're being so mean. Shara's found a new job, as we said last, as I said last week. And Tony <laughs> Wagner, our digital guy, is like, sure, I'll produce. He's and like, here come we are, on. Like, ragging on him. And now, anyway. now we're going to be all, we're going to be doing this ourselves next week. I'll tell you what. We deserved it. I used to do my own stuff. And then the engineer said, Kyle, you can't, you can't do that anymore. <gasps> it's true. Really? Oh, yeah. I used to they like, I used to, I used to record my own interviews and cut them and I do my own produce, my, my own promos and stuff. And one day <laughs> the lead engineer came to me and said, dude, man, you can't do that anymore. We're not going to let you do oh, that. It's a true story. Really? True story. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. Aww. Anyway. 
See, he's not a diva, you guys. He's just not allowed to touch anything anymore. <laughs> Let's do the mail. Okay. T- Tony's now getting on us in our headset saying, should we do the mail? Let's do the mail. Your turn. Okay, we'll do the mail. Hi, Kai and Molly. This Hello. This is Brent from Detroit. This Hi, is Brent. Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. Amen, my brother. All right. Maybe. So... Uh, we talked, I talked deep fakes last week um, and how f- freaking terrifying it is. We did that whole Bill Hader thing with Tom Cruise and all that. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody else's voice or, or face and face usually uh, into a totally made up context. Um, Todd Hansen said us this, talking about um, how fakes might not actually be the real point. Something I'm concerned about is not only the creation of more realistic fake news, but the fact that as the legitimately fake news becomes more realistic, it becomes easier and easier for nefarious actors to claim legitimate news is quote-unquote fake news. That is, like with many misinformation campaigns, the aim is not to alter truth, but to destroy truth, which we've seen plenty of in the past few years. My God. Yes. (laughs) Next. (laughs) I think the volcano just exploded. Josh Pollard. (laughs) Got into the nitty gritty of the technology a little bit. And here's his voice memo. I loved your segment on deep fakes. Your guest said that good deep fakes are built using two pieces, a synthesis engine to generate the video and a detection engine. The detection engine analyzes the video to see if it looks realistic enough. If it isn't, a new video is generated. Your guest also said they're working on technology to be able to specifically analyze video of political candidates to detect if they are fake. Aren't they essentially creating the best possible detection engine for the people making the deep (laughs) fakes? They are attempting to build a defense against it, but they're actually just making the weapon stronger. Yeah, we're screwed. Next. Uh, You know. (laughs) Yes. That, truly, I that's what I took away from that conversation. You do? All right. Wait. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll, we'll get there wait. in a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let All everybody right. give their thoughts here's, first, though. Here's Anthony Helm talking about journalism and this whole deep fakes thing. I'm calling about deep fakes, which I'm sincerely concerned about. More specifically, I'm concerned about what the major news outlets are going to do to prevent promoting a deep fake, especially an unverified one, when it gets released right before an election, whether it's the primaries or the general election, especially given the way the news hype cycle works. Yes, that too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. That is an area, a couple, okay. I wasn't here for this conversation, so I feel like I'm jumping in late, which is kind of rude. Especially since but, I left you hanging. But here's what I think. But, well, because I, so one thing that could come out of this might be the death of the viral video. Like, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if news outlets used first party video yeah. sources. Yeah. That's okay. Also, uh, this is so okay. There's one argument, and I'm not sure I totally buy my own argument here, but there's one argument that deep fakes are like the Y2K of the misinformation conversation because they are detectable. Like the technology exists to detect them now. For now. To Josh's point, the technology to detect them might end up making them better, and it will probably be a little bit of an arms race. But it is technologically possible to stop this in a way that it's less possible to stop the sort of insidiousness of the propaganda, the undermining how? of trust in truth in the first place. How, how is it technologically possible to stop this? Because I think what you're forgetting about in this equation is humanity. No, I'm, yeah, I'm literally just talking about the tech, oh, well, right? Like there is sure. tech to be able to analyze video of political candidates or any candidates yes. to detect if it's fake. Like you can yes. see if a video has been altered and r- the, and you can show the real video, right? When the Nancy yeah. Pelosi video went and, and the problem ultimately is way more insidious, which is not so much the deep fake, but that you can show someone a real video and they're not going to care. Yeah, but you can have all the technology in the world, and if you have a maliciously intended human being, mm-hmm. right, that it gets spread on Twitter and whatever, and then it gets picked up and network effects, and bang, before you know it, it's leading the NBC new- nightly news. Right, right, maybe not that, but you know what I mean, right? I do know what you mean. So I think, like, I think it is going to be incumbent on journalism to say, we're not running any video that we didn't shoot ourselves. Oh, Both yeah, stuff. all right, okay, all right, all right. Right, all right. which is great. That's better journalism. Like, yep. I think that there's, and, and, because the technology exists to detect a deep fake, it could do some damage in the short term, 
but it also can be corrected. The bigger concern to me is all of the ways that like bots and propaganda campaigns are mm -hmm, amplifying, mm -hmm, amplifying mm -hmm, all of this division mm -hmm. in the first place so, th so that you are not even inclined to believe the real video when right. you see it. Right. And I'm, to be honest, like I'm a little more worried about that than I am about deep fakes because there's a part of me and maybe this is just like the valley bubble, but there's part of me that's like technology can solve that. Oh, God. Yeah. The answer to Facebook's problems is more Facebook. So email me Anywho, and argue. Yeah. I am ready for it. Yes. Let's have this Make fight. Smart at marketplace.org, please. Attention, Molly Wood. Speaking of getting smarter, it is time for the Make <laughs> Me Smart question. <laughs> and this week, uh, the answer comes from Shara Morris because she is off to her new gig. And this is the very last episode that she helped produce. And so we encouraged, gently yeah. encouraged her. We forced her to answer the Make Me Smart question as her fa farewell. I think words were spoken that include, we had to do it had and to do so it. do you. Right. We did. So anyway, one more time. What is something you thought you knew but then found out you were wrong about? Shara Morris, hit us up. So growing up, I had these frameworks in my head of who I was. And there are simple things. Like, for example, I used to think and say in college that I didn't cook. Um, I said it because it was something my parents would say. And it was easy to define myself in those terms. Um, but in reality, it was just something I hadn't tried before. And I think I was uncomfortable moving around in a kitchen. As I got older, however, I began asking myself why I said that when I really hadn't done much cooking at all. So I started cooking my own dinners and it turned out I loved it. It's so creative, meditative, fulfilling. So while I find some self-identifiers can be helpful in understanding who you are, they can also be limiting and need to be periodically reevaluated. There you go, that was pretty good. That's like fantastic. That was really good. That's fantastic, yeah. I know. Yeah. Also, Tony told us that he has cooked many of the recipes that Shara recommended. So she's created a positive feedback loop there you go. of of the delight of cooking. I love there that you. though. I love yeah, the idea of one. not defining yourself by, I am like this, when you have never mm -hmm. considered being the other way. I, I've been that person. <laughs> All right. All right, what's your answer to the make me smart? This is not about me. What is your <laughs> answer to the make me smart question? <laughs> Please let us know. Send us a voice memo at make me smart at marketplace.org. Also, the newsletter plug, here it is. It's kind of great. Get you smarter every single week. Subscribe at marketplace.org slash newsletters. It's really good. There's all kinds of great stuff in there, truly. It's so good. Yeah. Yep. Make Me Smart was produced this week by Shara Morris Yay. and directed and produced ably, ably by Tony Wagner. Yes. Senior producer is Eve Tro. We had production oversight this week from Jody Becker. And thanks to our video producers, Ben Hethcote and Summer Dunsmore. This week's program was engineered by Daniel Ramirez. Theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Tarnieves. The senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. And I think that's all we got. You know who I am. You know I who Molly so. is. Yeah, I thought I there's said like that like little, there was more. There's like this little prompt here about What's this story, say? but I All should right, actually got, tell you probably the story. Got like 20 seconds. I met Hurry some. Up. I met some Make Me Smart super fans, and they were like, I was out with Ben Tolliday, and they were like, oh, Is that Ben Tolliday who did the music? Oh, is that right? Like, not oh, only great. are they huge fans of us and the show and all of that, they literally were like, oh, Ben Tolliday. Ben Tolliday. I love that. Yeah, that's great. And I'm they gonna, took I'm selfies with him. And it was awesome. Go give shit. Actually, is what I'm gonna have to do. Oh, yeah. Deb and Mary. Deb, Deb and Mary. Mary. You guys are the best. Great to meet you. There you go. We're hanging out in Oakland. <laughs>